Hello. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about how to get started with teaching literature using the Memoria Press Literature Program. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to focus on the primary and grammar school years. We can talk about upper school literature in another session. Let's begin with a look at what you need in order to successfully and easily complete a year of literature with Memoria Press. First, you need a student study guide for each student and one teacher guide. The teacher guide is important because it has the answers to the student guide layered on for you as well as quizzes and tests. Our first grade literature guide, Storytime and More Storytime Treasures, along with our second grade guides, do not have quizzes and tests because we don't test students on literature at these young ages. But you still need the teacher guides because they include phonics for reading activities which are essential for building confidence in young readers. We realized years ago that phonics for reading is totally separate from a spelling program. Students are ready to read more difficult words before they're ready to spell them. So at Memoria Press, we've separated the phonics for reading out into our literature guides. Before students read, they're introduced to the more difficult words that they're going to encounter, including common words. So when they come upon these words in their reading, they can move through them without frustration. Classical phonics and our phonics flashcards from kindergarten are also needed to complete these phonics lessons. This is an essential part of our first and second grade literature program. Beginning in third grade, the phonics is dropped from our guides. We are assuming we have fluent readers by now, but we've added quizzes and tests. Also, we need to hear younger students read aloud every day. So this teacher of first and second grade students is going to know the answers to all the questions in the literature guides because you have shared the reading experience with your student. But in the grammar school years, many students are ready to read independently. And though it's still important for you to have your students read aloud each day in some capacity, it doesn't have to be literature. And if you don't have time to keep up with their reading, you will need the answers in the teacher guide to make sure your student is on the right track and to enable you to discuss books with your student that you may not have read. So for younger students, you need the teacher guides to get your phonics lessons. And for older students, the teacher guides will provide help with answers and discussion as well as the assessments needed to make sure your students are comprehending. In addition to the student guide and teacher guide, you will also need the novel. It's up to you how many novels you need. Many teachers have their own copy of the novel in addition to the student's copy. And if you have more than one student studying the same book, you may want each student to have his or her own copy. We encourage students to mark their books as they note important or beautiful passages. But if you're on a tight budget, you can buy one novel and use it over and over for different students. If you need to do that, you will want to limit each student making marks in the book. The final tool you will want to consider is our lesson plans. We've put together lesson plans for each year of literature through 10th grade, so you can make sure you're moving at a good pace and will complete three to four books a year. The other advantage to the lesson plans is that they may make your older student more independent. Students will know what they need to complete each day. Our lesson plans are laid out so that literature should take approximately one hour each day. Of course, the lesson plans are optional. You can easily make your own schedule, but we've done all the hard work for you, so why not take advantage of that? And our lesson plans come directly out of our classrooms, so they've been tried and tested by master teachers over the years. Now that we have all of our books lined up, the next step is to read the teaching guidelines in the front of the literature guides and in the front of the lesson plans. And another thing I would advise, assuming you can find the time, is to read all the novels you will be teaching in the summer before your school year begins. I know that can be difficult to do, but if you go into your year with a basic knowledge of what your students will be studying, you will feel more prepared to teach and it will set you up for success. And who doesn't like to sit by a pool or at the beach or under a tree in your yard reading a classic children's book taking you back to your own childhood. This is just a suggestion though, I am not trying to put a guilt trip on anyone or make you feel more burdened than you already do. 
My last piece of advice to prepare you to be an amazing literature teacher is to mark your teacher guide for each lesson with the questions that will appear on the tests. A few of our guides for younger students have those questions marked for you. But if you're using a guide that doesn't have them marked, go ahead and do that for yourself. This will help you to know what to focus on as you discuss each lesson. The things that we want students to take away from each lesson will be on the test. So to summarize your preparation as a teacher, I strongly recommend that you familiarize yourself with the teaching guidelines, pre-read the novels, and mark the test questions in your teacher guide ahead of time. And now you are ready to teach. The good news is that each lesson is basically the same, giving continuity and confidence to students. Once you learn how to teach literature the Memoria Press way, students will never be surprised or unsure about the expectations for their work. So let's see what a lesson should look like. First, we go to the study guide and look at the reading notes. The reading notes are specifically to introduce cultural terms or large words students may not be familiar with. You can read them aloud while students look at them, or you can have students read them. This should only take a couple of minutes. The next step is to fill out the vocabulary section of the study guide. Note that we haven't even opened the novel yet. The reading notes and vocabulary act as a preface to the reading we are about to do. The purpose of the vocabulary is to help students try to figure out the meaning of the vocabulary words within the context of their reading. So this requires a conversation. Students can't memorize the meaning of every word in the dictionary. So we want to help them read discerningly, not to skip over words they don't know, but to have the skill to guess the meaning within the context of their reading. This is a tool that will benefit them throughout their reading lives. So let's talk about how to teach the vocabulary. First, put the words on the board and talk about them. Ask students if they can figure out a good synonym to replace the, the word. If they are randomly guessing and it becomes painful or silly, go ahead and give them the word from the teacher manual. This is a good time to point out the part of speech too. Take advantage of this opportunity for a mini grammar lesson. Talking about the meaning of each word, and there will rarely be more than six words per lesson, can get tedious. So to shake it up a little, you can put all the meanings on the board scrambled up and have the students match them to the words. If you see I've put three vocabulary words, this is from our Robin Hood study guide, on the board, and I can talk to the students about each one of these words based on the context of the sentence which we've put in the study guide. But if I'm in a rush or really it just feels like I don't have the time to do that, to have that conversation, then I can put the meanings, the synonyms that we've chosen for each of these words and then you can see that it would be fairly easy for the students to guess that the coffers are treasure chests, the steward is the household manager, and transfixed means pierced. This will speed your vocabulary work up. And I know it's tempting to throw a dictionary at students and tell them to look the words up while you do something else, but I want to encourage you to spend a little time talking about these words with your students. That's the way to help them learn how to deal with unfamiliar words as they read. Finally, have students mark the words that are on the quiz or test coming up, and if you already have them marked in your teacher guide, this will be easy and only take a minute. The reading notes and vocabulary should take about 10 minutes to complete, and they have prepared your students to read. So now, it's time to pick up the novel, and the fun begins. There are several ways you can complete the reading of each chapter. As I said earlier, students do need to read aloud each day. First and second grade students need to be reading their literature aloud to you because they're still working on reading fluency. If it's too much for them to read, take turns with them so that you're bearing some of the burden of reading aloud. Focus on expression, short pauses for commas, longer pauses for periods, reading loud enough and reading smoothly. In our curriculum, our students continue to read aloud through high school. In primary school, we're working on general reading fluency. But in high school, we're working on fluency in reading Shakespeare, Homer, and Dante aloud, another difficult challenge. Students also need to be read to every day, giving them a model of what good oral reading sounds like. Once students are good fluent readers, they can begin reading silently, 
usually second or third grade. This is a different skill. Students learning to read to themselves and to stay focused on the content of what they are reading. In the younger grades, we tend to read silently the second or third time students read. So we have already read the material aloud. But students can reread silently. And all these different types of reading, oral reading, reading to students, and silent reading can be spread throughout the different subjects. They don't necessarily all need to happen in literature class. Once you've completed your reading, it's time to answer the comprehension questions in the study guide. So we begin in the study guide with reading notes and vocabulary, took a break to read, and now we go back to the study guide. The comprehension question answers that are in the teacher manuals are complete answers for the teacher's benefit. But the answers that should go into the student study guides are the answers they come up with themselves. They don't need to be as thorough or as long as the teacher manual answers. For third grade, we want to see a third grade student answer, and so forth. For younger students, we do all comprehension questions together, with the teacher asking for a student to give an oral answer to the question, then asking a student to put that oral answer into a good sentence. The teacher writes the student given answer on the board, and the class talks about it. Is it a sentence? Is it concise? Does it thoroughly answer the question? Once we have a good sentence on the board, students copy it into their study guides using correct punctuation, capitalization, and spelling. As students get older and better able to work independently, we begin transitioning them so that they are writing good sentences on their own that we can then check using the teacher guide answers. Let me give you an example of what it looks like for us, the students to come up with their own answer to a question. And again, I'm going to use Robin Hood as my example. So one of the comprehension questions is, why did Much the Miller kill one of the king's deer? And the answer in the teacher guide is, he killed the deer to feed his starving family. They were hungry because John's men had burned his mill to the ground to make room for the deer. And a good student answer could look like this. Much killed the deer to feed his family. They were starving because his mill was burned down. It's much shorter, but it's thorough, it's concise, and it answers the question. So it's just fine. We want the student to have their answer in their study guide, not the teacher answer. And if you are relying heavily on the teacher guide because you haven't had time to read the novel yourself, I encourage you to have a conversation with your student about his or her reading. You can easily figure out what is going on in the story based on the questions and answers we've provided in the guides. It's important that you don't think of the study guide as a workbook. It should be the catalyst for a conversation about what the student is experiencing in the novel. Use the literature guide as a tool. But the real lesson should come from a discussion that will bring the characters and events in each book to life. Finally, each guide will have a variety of questions, of expressions, quotations, questions for discussion, and enrichment activities that you can complete as you have time and interest. These are supplemental. But again, these areas in the study guides are to influence discussion and can be more abstract, requiring a higher level of thinking. So the discussion should be teacher-led and can be used at the teacher's discretion as far as time and interest permit. The enrichment activities can also be used as honors work for motivated students who like an extra challenge. This sounds like a lot to complete for each lesson, but if you follow our lesson plans, you will see that you don't have to complete an entire lesson each day. Our literature curriculum was not chosen randomly. We have spent years fine-tuning it, and our hope is that we can have a small part in developing in your students a love of reading and the skill to read deliberately and with discernment. Happy reading until we meet again.